library. The Caradron Overlords are found in the realm of Chamon, the realm of metal. It is one of eight mortal realms, a place where transmutation is law, and iron deserts, bronze mountains, seas of silver, and plains of brass are real. Ether gold can be found in the clouds, which is harvested by the Caradron overlords. Sigmar hopes to rekindle this ancient alliance from the Age of Myth with the Dwardin and reclaim the Silverway from Zench. The Caradron overlords are a militaristic and mercantile society, distinct from the other branches of the Dwardin present in the mortal realms. Like their kindred, the Caradron overlords are shorter than humans, broad-shouldered and known for their thick beards, great stamina, and gruff natures. All are relentless workers driven to hone their craft. Just as the Fire Slayers honor their word, the Caradron treat sworn oaths as sacrosanct, but they are more likely than other Duardin to exploit loopholes in less than explicit contractual wording, especially if doing so will add substantially to their profits. The Caradron overlords excel at both trade and war, and have no qualms about shifting rapidly from one to the other as needed or opportunity arises. For instance, before engaging in mining activities atop a mountain, they must first fight back the indigenous peoples that use the peak for primitive rituals. Later, however, the Dwardin will not hesitate to seek out the defeated natives to offer peaceful trade terms. In the beginning, the Caradron overlords bartered metal tools or weapons for foodstuffs or animal skins, but as the grip of chaos in the mortal realms lessens, so do their trade partners multiply as nomadic tribes come out of hiding and establish their own settlements. Every one of the skyports has dozens of business partners, and the Caradron air fleets not only guard their own innumerable mining operations and merchant routes, but often go to battle in support of their trading partners' interests. Such actions are not due to kind-heartedness, but rather pure pragmatism. The practical-minded Caradron stand to benefit far more safeguarding their lucrative commercial practices than they do returning to the isolationist ways that marked their existence during the Age of Chaos. Indeed, business in all six of the major skyports is booming. The Caradron's success is not down to the hard work alone, but also to the strict adherence to a set of guiding principles that they observe. The Caradron Code specifies the rules of commerce, clarifying which trade associates should be protected and which should be left to their own devices should they come under attack. To make a decision based solely on emotions would be considered foolish, merely a repeat of the old ways that nearly led to the Dwardin's extinction. Caradron society is run like a well-oiled and expertly crafted machine. It is a multi-level meritocracy in which each ship, clan, company, guild, and member of the Caradron Council is chosen for their position based upon their talents, recent successes, and perceived ability to lead the way towards greater prosperity. To wield power based purely on inheritance is to the Caradron overlords a blueprint for failure. The driving agenda is to generate profit, and although they might vie constantly with each other in the name of doing so, they are not underhanded. All their dealings are in accordance with the Caradron Code, and as long as its edicts are maintained, then a deal is considered fair. The Dwardin that escaped the fall of the Mountain Kingdoms spent years simply fighting for survival which led to the desperate airborne realms forging a loose confederation for mutual protection. But as the skyports grew, so did their rivalries. All sought to mine the same ether gold that kept their societies flourishing and afloat. On the verge of civil war, the leaders of each skyport met in council. It was this confederate of Madralta named after the floating isle where the meeting took place, 
that produced the document known as the Caradron Code, or simply referred to most of the time as the Code, colloquially. The Dwarden leaders sought to establish laws that would see them prosper despite the Age of Chaos. They wished to avoid the pitfalls of the past, for the rule of kings had failed them, and even the gods had deserted them. All the survivors had seen the fate of those that awaited the divine aid of Grugni, Grimnir, or Sigmar. The Caradron Code was based upon the ship's codes that captains from every developing skyport devised in one form or another. They were a set of practical guidelines for shipmates, born of necessity, ensuring discipline, quantifiable personal profit, and compensation for death or injury. Above all, they were created for the good of the ship. The Code simply took these articles and expanded upon them to cover the governance of their entire society, expanding logically until this encompassed the whole civilization. The Code stipulates everything, from how ether gold deposits can be claimed to the rules for engaging foes. The original document included nine articles, which subdivided into many sections. Therein could be found the Articles of Union, the Seven Articles of Prosperity, and the Twelve Points of Election. Over time, there have been amendments to the Code, though some skyports refute them. Most notably, Banak Thring. Even upon agreed articles, there is often room for interpretation, and some captains particularly those hailing from the roguish Barak Morna, are notably agile in their ability to navigate the framework of the code. Conveniently, when it is useful for them to do so. Ether gold, also called the breath of Grugni, is the lifeblood of all Caradron society, for this lighter-than-air metal holds their cities aloft fuels their skyships, and empowers a great portion of their weaponry. Without an ever-increasing supply of the substance, the airborne metropolises would quite literally fall. Mining ether gold is dangerous work. In its natural state, ether gold is a gas or vapour, running through the skies just as loads of precious metals run through the ground. Only when refined does the metal solidify, its hardened form resembling mundane gold, only with a far brighter sheen. Often hidden within cloud banks, or rendered all but invisible by their transient nature, ether gold deposits are difficult to locate, and harder still to mine. Concentrated seams of ether gold are prone to drift, carried far by air currents, and their presence attracts all manner of beasts, the majority of which are extremely dangerous, such as the Harakin, Chimera, and Meglofi. During the harvesting of large accumulations of ether gold, it is not a question of if such monsters will attack, but when. Most non caradron denizens of the mortal realms that know of its existence regard ether gold as magical, for it has countless strange properties. In great volumes it causes unusual atmospheric conditions. Whole veins are shifted hundreds of miles in the blink of an eye by fierce ether storms, and coalesce drops of the precious mineral that fall from the skies induce fits of maddening paranoia in those caught in such deluges. The Caradron overlords themselves do not subscribe to the notion that ether gold is magical. Instead, they use many of their burgeoning forms of scientific research to identify and catalogue the myriad unusual effects produced by the substance, and attempt to research scientific explanations for why these occur. Should a rich vein of ether gold be discovered, the sky fleets cordon off the surrounding airways while the rest of the armada set to work. Larger operations employ cloud dredgers and trawlers to sweep the area, siphoning and straining the raw ether gold. 
but the fleet is small, an exploratory or prospecting flotilla sent to find new veins. Then it will be composed entirely of warships. Although equipped primarily for battle, the ever practical Caradron also use such fleets for mining and trade operations. Should the dangers of mining ether gold be avoided, the extracted gas is stored within holds of airships, or in larger mining fleets within a vast hulks known as Krom tankers. Many convoys transport the mined material in a steady stream away from the mine, heading back to the skyport from which the fleets originate. This too is dangerous work, for even in the armour-plated holds of Caradron ships, the siren call of the substance attracts those beasts and airborne raiders that lust after it. Many a convoy has been smashed out of the sky by raging chimera packs, pulled down into sludge clouds by tentacled nightmares, or brought to battle by the aerial armies of the grotbag scuttlers. Despite the importance of ether gold, it is not the only source of commerce for the Caradron overlords. Trade between skyports is vital, and now that the Code has decreed Drek Urb, the opening up of trade with other races, other markets have become quite lucrative as well. Many skyports have begun to extract tolls from travellers along mountain passes or run transport networks through their own cleverly concealed realm gates. During the Age of Chaos, civilizations were broken, and dispossessed peoples were forced to flee the ruins of their shattered kingdoms. Cast adrift, many of those exiled were slain or captured and pressed into slavery. Those that escaped did so by finding hidden enclaves or living as nomads, forever fleeing to stay ahead of many armies and monstrous ravagers bound to no man. The Duarden were driven out of mountain holds, save only in Akushi, where the fire slayers held many of their ancestral homes against the tides of invaders. Most exiled Duarden were slain, for they had many enemies. Once ousted from their fastnesses, the refugees were vulnerable, ripe for extinction and genocide. In Chamon, however, some Duardin fled in an unexpected direction, to the skies. There the ancestors of the Caradron overlords carved out a foothold using their newest weapon, the Sky Fleets. Early designs evolved into what would later become the Arcanaut class of airship, sleek, armor-plated, and capable of carrying a complement of crew and warriors. The Arcanaut frigate became the mainstay of Caradron fleets, with the larger ironclads serving as flagships. Since the earliest days, the Dwardin learned to outfit their skyborne ships with as much weaponry as possible. There was no rampaging Chaos armies scouring the upper atmosphere, but the Dwardin swiftly learned that danger abounded up in the clouds. The black powder weapons of yore were replaced, with the majority of the Arcanauts' impressive arsenals now powered athematically. The sky dwellings that were once but temporary refuges were built up, becoming vast growing cities. When the true riches of the upper atmosphere were discovered, all plans to return to ground-based living were abandoned, and it was the sky fleets that made it all possible. Sky fleets are used to seek out ether gold and to protect those mining it. The sky fleets transport cargo, and each sky port maintains patrol fleets that protect the airspace above and around the floating cities, as well as common trade routes. In essence, they are the very lifeblood of the Caradron overlords. Across each of the different skyports, it is the desire of every young beardling to serve aboard the new air fleets. Competition is fierce amongst the company-sponsored aeronautical academies. Their retired crew and captains teach and pass notoriously ruthless judgments upon 
their charges, offering ratings to only the most able-bodied. It is in their best interest to do so, of course, for they own stock in the fleets and will be rewarded only if the newly crewed ships can return profits and continue to grow their business. As the Caradron Code states, every ship must bear a captain, a leader who rules the craft absolutely. Whilst aboard, none save the Admiralty have the right to disobey an order. Crews are chosen at the muster press, and can come from different academies within the same skyport. Although they hail from different families and backgrounds, once aboard, the crew are bonded by many oaths and code-prescribed rituals. Crew pride themselves on their loyalty to ship and shipmates, and invariably the most successful of the Sky Fleets employ crew that have served together for decades. It is possible, as laid out by Article 1.5 of the Code, for crew to usurp a captaincy. This is not some riotous act of mutiny, but rather meritocracy at work. Subclauses of the Code mandate the replacement of captains that do not bring success on a ship. For to rest upon the laurels of past triumphs is not the way of the carriage rod. Captains so deposed are not dishonoured, but merely lose their rank and join the crew, as per Article 1.6, where they might rise or fall based on their own achievements, like all the others. The rule for each skyport is headed by an Admiral's Council, which presides over a body of the six most powerful guilds. Only the most successful ever make the Admiral's Council, and to serve on that illustrious board is the goal of all who set sail upon an airship. The six governing guilds beneath the Admiral's Council are the same in each skyport, although where each stands in the hierarchy can fluctuate from city to city. The one exception, however, is that the sky fleets are always the most influential guild, as the gathering of ether gold would be impossible without their ships. Dwardin that serve in the fleets and survive will reap vast profits. Each member of a ship's crew is a shareholder, a non-managing member, and each fleet is backed by a council originally comprising 76 members, but later reduced to 60, who act as managing directors. Beneath the sky fleets are the Kazukan, the conglomerate of all the city's craftsfolk, the Aether Chemists Guild, the Grund Corps, the Nav League, and the Endroneers Guild. All hold shares in the fleets and provide aid to them, either through the sponsorship or provision of their own specialists. Above even the Admiral's Council of each skyport is the Geldrad, the highest ruling body of Caradron Overlord Society. It is composed of members from the six wealthiest skyports, and the number of delegates provided by each determined by capital. One additional seat is given to a different minor skyport every 25 shifts of the Straustrom, the great wind stream. The guilds, the Nav League. The Nav League is made of Aetheric Navigators, a secretive order of the Aereo Cartographers. It is their law that has mapped out the troposphere and the sections of the stratosphere. They study the elements especially the winds and shifting energies of Chamon. They guide the sky fleets along aerial trade routes, seeking to catch thermals and avoid the many atmospheric perils. Only those that quickly solve complex mathematical formulas under great duress can hope to pass the entrance exams to attend one of the nav academies. Yet no matter how rigorous the trading, it is nothing compared to hanging on to the deck rails whilst trying to calculate the shifting currents of the Straustrom. Just one of the many duties a navigator is called upon to perform aboard an airship. The Aether Chemists Guild. The Aether Chemists are alchemic scientists. 
It is with their knowledge that even cloud-obscured Aethergold seems can be located and followed. Indeed, it is only by the genius of their guild's inventions that ether gold can be siphoned from clouds and refined into a solid substance. The guild trains its members to use a wide range of gadgets, including analytic recogitators, heliotropic distillators, and the god's lung. Yet their methods are not solely experimental in nature, for an ether chemist must also learn to grade the quality of ether gold through by the only means known, by smell. Aether chemists maintain guilds in all but the smallest of skyports, but Barak Ubaz has by far the greatest number, and their members are renowned for their skill at wringing Aether gold from the air. The Endrineers Guild the most mechanically inclined Caradron are apprenticed to this guild, the Endrineers Guild. All Skyports have guild-run Endrineering Academies, the largest of which are the great cog halls of Barak Zilfin. Those who demonstrate skill find profitable employment as artificers, metal casters, forge keepers, or shipwrights, but only the very best and bravest are sent to work on the Arcanaut fleets themselves. There they serve the ships as Endrin riggers, or should they survive long enough to accomplish full mech mastery, as Endrin masters. The guild is just as protective of its machines as the rights that keep them running. The Arcanaut sky fleets. At the top of an air fleet's hierarchy are its commissioned officers. Each airship has a captain, whose rule over his craft is absolute. When enough ships are grouped together, however, an admiral is appointed to overall command, and his authority extends further still. Each skyport has a number of admirals at its disposal, and each of these has the potential to command an entire air fleet. The other officers in the fleet hail not from the Arcanaut, training academies, but rather are specialists from the guilds, Aetheric navigators, Aether chemists, and Endrin masters. These warrant officers are assigned wherever their skills will serve the Skyfleet best, but commonly go to war upon its Arcanaut ironclad. Arcanaut frigates and ironclads are the ships of the line and the mainstay of the fleet. Acting as bombers, gunships or transport craft when the Admiral sees fit. An Admiral can pick any ship within the fleet to call his capital ship. This is most often the largest vessel, usually an ironclad, but sometimes a frigate of long or distinguished service will have the ceremonial honour of bearing him into battle. Grunstock grunhaulers, meanwhile, are hired escort-class fighters used as interdiction craft or to launch swift assault runs. There have been instances where raids or even large-scale battles have been brought to a successful and profitable conclusion by the use of these ships alone. Finally, the Sky Riggers are mobile rapid response specialists whose roles require them to maneuver among the other elements of the fleet as the situation demands. Endrin riggers usually enter battle alongside the flagship, but will scramble to repair other ships as necessary. The offence-orientated role of Sky Wardens usually makes them outcompany the Grund Corps, although in terms of fleet hierarchy they answer directly to the captains and admiral. The Caradron overlords are spread throughout the mortal realms, but their wealth is centralised in the floating skyports of Chamon in the realm of metal, with six great cities.